Born and raised in Texas, Jeb Bush moved to Florida in 1980. The son and brother of presidents, he himself was governor of the Sunshine State from 1999 to 2007, where he quickly became known as a champion of school choice and fiscal responsibility. In 2016, he had an unsuccessful run for president, and he now resides in Miami-Dade County, happily retired from political life. A self-proclaimed old-school conservative with libertarian blood running through his veins, I talked to Bush in October for a special issue of Reason devoted to all things Florida. He told me the reasons he believes more people are moving to Florida than any other state, what he thinks of current Governor Ron DeSantis and leading Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump, his problems, and they are many, with President Joe Biden, and what's so special about immigration and America. Governor Jeb Bush, thanks for talking to Reason. Honored to be with you, Nick. Uh, so let's start with uh, the question of, you know, Florida has become the fastest growing state in the country. What explains Florida's growth as a destination for people wanting to move there and live there and work there? Uh, I think Florida works pretty good. It's like whatever problems we have uh, pale by comparison to to other states. And I mean, like if you, no disrespect to the Northeast, but if you have business up there like I do, and you go and you drive, like you're going to get a broken back basically trying to go from here to there because the infrastructure is, is decayed. The challenges are immense. And you come here and the roads the roads are working. We've got a lot of people on them, but uh, fewer potholes, things work better. And so it's for people that come to visit, they can kind of get uh, the allure of Florida. And then typically what happens is they visit a few times and then they say, all right, I'm making the, when I'm making did, the jump. When did you move there? What year? 1980. 1980. And Florida has at least since the, I mean, in the post-war era, but definitely in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and continuing just saw really kind of explosive growth. Texas has also where you grew up. You went to school at University of Texas, Austin. Yeah. Uh, I hope that they lose in whatever, you know, football games that they have coming up this season. I'm rooting for Ohio State. Be that as it may, both Texas and, and Florida, uh, two states that have become reliably red, are now kind of kicking the butt of New York and California. The, these four states are the four most populous states in the country. Um, is there something going on where the general kind of political system in Florida and Texas is being revealed as better than the ones that are in place in California and New York? Uh, in Miami-Dade County, where I live, has two and a half million people. It's a big urban teeming place full of uh, diversity. It has a 1.4% unemployment rate. I mean, mm -hmm. effectively, it used to be, Nick, we're old enough to remember full employment was like at 4%. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, people are, half the people have two jobs, I guess. I don't know. It's like, it's it's full of opportunities. Um, the tax code matters, obviously, for people uh, with more wealth, mm -hmm. for sure. We don't have income tax. We have smaller governments. The impulse isn't to like uh, try to tax your way to prosperity or regulate your way to prosperity. It's not a perfect place for sure. I get nervous about bragging too much because the minute you stop challenging basic assumptions about the role of government is your atrophy sets in and, mm -hmm. you know, government kind of just starts filling the seams. And uh, so we've had a great run because we've had a period of limited government uh, and and we don't try to like micromanage people's lives. Mm -hmm. And as long as we do that and we stay focused on the important long-term things, and I would say make making sure infrastructure stays up with the growth, making sure our natural systems are protected, which is a important uh, conservative principle in my mind mm -hmm. is, you know, you could rape and pillage the, the, uh, the swamplands around South Florida and you would have a hell of a problem going forward. So, investing in these long-term things, which they don't do in California and New York because they've made, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they made obligations to the unions and obligations in the here and now. 
that that creates a government that is far bigger than it is in Texas or in Florida. How, talk a bit more about conservation efforts or the environment in Florida is a big deal because, you know, it's a state that is surrounded by water on, you know, three sides, right? Um and yeah. environmental regulations tend to be um, looked askance by conservatives. Uh, it, they're also expensive. How, how, uh, when you were governor, how did you manage to keep environmental regulations in place that preserve, you know, the ecosystem, you know, the kind of natural infrastructure, but also didn't overwhelm the ability to kind of create jobs and, and build, you know, space for more people to move there? So uh, we had a land purchasing program that, that identified the pristine areas, the watersheds that were important to protect, uh, that otherwise could eventually become developed. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we either did conservation easements or we purchased them. We purchased or did conservation easements. Um, we did $3 billion, probably $4 billion mm -hmm. uh, during, during eight years. Um, directly appropriations for the legislature and a Florida forever program where we took dock stamp revenues. Basically the growth of the state was taxed, um, through transfer taxes during, you know, when you, when you sell or buy a piece of property and that money was bonded to buy these properties and it was called Florida forever. Mm -hmm. And that's a tradition that is bipartisan, but Republicans have been just as aggressive, uh, in protecting these long-term things because Florida would be a crappy place to live if if we develop uh along the watersheds mm -hmm. first and, and secondly it would make it really hard to we don't have dams i mean we had the tallest place in florida is 10 miles <laughs> south of alabama um, we have 55 inches of rainfall yeah. and it all goes out to tide basically so protecting these systems is also good to be able to continue to grow, to, to have water capacity for urban development, for agriculture, and for the natural systems. So, you know, conservation, uh, low taxes, low business regulation allows the economy to grow and for people to be able to move there. What about the cultural side? And that, that may not be the right word, but I'm when you look at the history of Florida, you know, through the 60s, it, it was part of the Confederacy. It was a segregated state. Um, you know, somehow in the 70s uh, and beyond, it really moved into a modern phase. Um, how, you know, you, you don't get the sense that Floridians in the 1950s were kind of the hustling entrepreneurs that you see there now. How did the culture change and how important is that to the vitality of, of a place to live? That's a great question. My, my gubernatorial hero um, was uh, Governor Collins. Wasn't a Republican. I don't think there were any Republicans back then right. in the 1950s. He, his first, before he got elected, before he got inaugurated, he took a trade mission to Latin America. I mean, like, who does that? Um, not in the 1950s. Uh, and he fought against segregation. Uh, successive governors worked hard on economic development. And the population itself changed. We became, you were totally right. I mean, people down here in Miami, when I, when I came, they were calling it Miami, mm -hmm. like a Southern town. So the combination of influx of immigrants an influx of other people, of people from other parts of the country and pretty progressive leadership that says, we're not going to be successful unless we, you know, you can be respectful of the past mm -hmm. of the Southern heritage for sure. But uh, I think the aspiration, and I certainly felt this way when I was governor, uh, we're not a, we're not a region. We're, a, you know, we're, a, we're a region in ourselves. We're a mega state and we need to behave like that. Um, and so, uh, one of the challenges we face is I always got really pissed off when people said, uh, you know, I asked them, where are you from? I did it as a matter of habit. And they would say, I'm from Pennsylvania. I said, no, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. You're from Florida. I'm like, come on be proud of the place. And I think that's kind of caught on now. I yeah. think people are actually very proud to live here. What um, What's the role of education? The, the South as a region kind of historically lagged in education for a variety of reasons. Florida, particularly under your uh, guidance, really started setting a path for, you know, the state funding, um, you know, not just education in general, but more choice and things like that. You know, when we're talking, yeah. you know, we're talking roads, we're talking, you know, the environment, we're talking tax regulation. What about education? 
So this is this is what is not discussed in in detail, but like look, call it say Chicago or, or you know Washington D.C. or New York, they spend twenty five thousand dollars per student. You divide in, it all in up. The state more or less, of New I mean, York, the average per pupil spending is about thirty grand a year. Average of the right. state. I was trying to be kind. Mm -hmm. How much of that is basically to pay for the sins of the past? Mm -hmm. Pension obligations that were negotiated, healthcare benefits for retirees. How much is that is actually going to the classroom? Mm -hmm. Compare that to Florida, where we, you know, our people in the past didn't do that. In fact, you know, when I was governor, we eliminated tenure. We moved to uh, an option for a defined uh, contribution plan rather than defined mm -hmm. benefit. The pension was is, you know, effectively well funded compared to other states. So you can focus on the here and now in the education. So our funding, while it's less than the national average, um, in terms of classroom education, I think is pretty good. And then we didn't just accept the status quo. We graded schools, you know, and if schools were failing, parents would give them options. We eliminated social promotion. We created real robust accountability. We put a real focus on early childhood literacy, and we created the most expansive public and private uh, parental choice programs in the country. And the net result is parents like here in Miami-Dade, third or fourth largest school district in the country, 70% of the parents, of the students, parents decide where their kids go to school. Mm -hmm. Think of that. I mean, do you think, I mean, would Los Angeles be better? Yeah. Would Chicago be better? Would New York be better under that system? Hell yeah, it would. And, and so we've seen, uh, particularly with in the lower income communities, kids of color, mm -hmm. kids with learning disabilities, we're top five in the country based on the nation's report card. There's still a long way to go. And then I, then I would add, Nick, um, over, I'm not talking about the U.S. News and World Report kind of input driven rankings of colleges, but the more quantitative, you know, the more qualitative rankings. University of Florida is like top two or three public university right. in the country in terms of entrance rates, in terms of research, in terms of graduation rates, in terms of and it's free. It's it's I mean, don't get Bernie Sanders upset about mm -hmm. this, but we actually have uh bright future scholarships so anybody that um, qualifies for that does not pay tuition and if you do pay tuition it's about the lowest tuition in the country maybe second lowest in the country um so that's a pretty good deal it's about the best deal a family will ever get from government uh, irrespective of what state they're eventually going to live in right to be able to get a high quality education so yeah all the way i don't know I, I think yeah, Can pre -K, I have, we have universal pre-K. What is your sense of, <clears throat> excuse me, legislation under the current governor, Ron DeSantis, things like the Stop Woke Act, which, you know, affect higher education as well as K through 12. Um, and it it does not seem to be, you know, particularly, uh, you know, good for academic freedom uh, as well as freedom of expression. Does that concern you? Um, it, it concerns me a little bit. Um, I do think that if you're in fourth grade or below that you you shouldn't be accessing any issue you know any discussion mm -hmm. of sexual orientation uh, unless that your was parents the so -called don't choose to put you in a school where that's part of the curriculum of course yeah. or, or or if your parent decides that you know after school right. they can talk all they want about that stuff I don't, i'm not sure there'd be like one percent of parents yeah. that would talk to a kindergartner about this but stuff. I'm thinking that, more of the you know higher education because it is you're right that Florida you know both University of Florida Florida State certainly uh, University of Central Florida which is now I think the largest institution in the country yep. um, that's you know where you're hearing people you know including faculty saying like I I can't teach history under under this kind of law. I don't know. I mean, uh, look, the governor has uh as a master at virtue signaling mm -hmm. but so is the left mm -hmm. i mean we're in this virtue signaling food fight i'm not sure the substance of the the uh, uh the bills that have passed have created a dangerous place for speech mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not certain that that's the case but i do think we have to be vigilant about it it's one thing to say you can't like impose these woke cultural values on everybody uh which i think is an issue it's the other thing to say well therefore we're going to impose our values on um on everybody i, I just I'm, I'm a you know i'm kind of an old school uh 
conservative with libertarian blood running through my veins. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what we need to find is an environment where we let people have an honest discourse. And if you believe, you know, you believe what I believe, you, you should have the you know, a right to discuss it and defend it. And you should allow other people, the, the people that may disagree with aren't the enemy. They just might be wrong and have an open dialogue. And I think our universities are pretty good at that compared to other places where we're seeing right now, you know, if you're a Jewish kid going to one of these elite schools, mm -hmm. you're in danger. I mean, that is ridiculous uh, what's going on. So both sides uh, have these impulses that I think I'm uncomfortable with, but I would say the left is probably uh, much worse than the right. Uh, we talked about uh, Florida being like the destination for places. It has the fifth uh, highest foreign born population as a percentage of its residents in the country. Uh, in 2022, yeah. more Americans moved from other states to Florida than any other state in terms of net migration. Uh, my question is, do immigrants, whether they're from outside the country or within the country, do they bring their values with them? This is what you hear a lot. You know, Venezuelans coming into Florida are going to turn it into, you know, Venezuela of the north. Um, New Yorkers, Californians going to, Calif uh, to Florida are going to bring those governmental systems with them. Do you, do you believe that um, or do you think that's off? Uh, I think it's off. I, 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 it's always been a concern, you know, that all these uh, whoever from wherever they come and they bring their values. But I mean, think about it. If someone's leaving California and there's quite a few Californians that have moved here from more to Texas and to Arizona. But if they're leaving, they're leaving for a reason. Uh, they're probably leaving because they want economic opportunity for themselves and their families or they're tired of being taxed to death. You know, so one of the interesting uh data points in terms of migration is I think 25% of all of the income that has moved from one state to the other has moved to Florida, 25%. So these are high income people that are moving here because, you know, like if you live in New York city, uh, the next budget shortfall, which is probably next month, the first idea, the second idea, the third idea is tax the rich. Well, there's probably, you know, one percent of the taxpayers probably pay forty percent of the the budget. These guys are really stupid to do this, but they keep doing it. And so you've got you know people migrate for different reasons. The immigrants from other countries, there is no evidence that Hugo Chavez is going to do well in uh, yeah <laughs> in Miami. I well, promise Castro, you that. Though, right? Castro. I mean, obviously, the Cubans who moved from Cuba, you know, they yeah. love Castro. That's really what they were coming to, to America for, right? <laughs> Um, what do you exactly? Um, so these, but the point I wanted to make because uh, you know in Miami Dade County, which I keep talking yeah. about because I live here, sixty five percent, maybe seventy percent of the people in this county were born outside the country. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like it in the rest of the country. Yeah. Los Angeles may come close, and these are patriotic people. Mm -hmm. There is no woke. I mean, people don't walk around with pronouns in their mm -hmm. you know calling cards around here. Um, they believe in freedom. They've left oppressive regimes. Mm -hmm. They're concerned when they see policies that try to impose, um, you know, a heavy hand of government. Um, it's chaotic. It's diverse. It's fun. Yeah. Um, and and it's uh, it adds a dynamism that is really remarkable. It's, it's what, the, what the principal reason why I moved in 1980, and it's even better now. Yeah. What do you make though of the anti-immigrant sentiments that you know are definitely on the rise throughout the country? But people like Ron DeSantis, uh, people like Donald Trump, who, you know, I'm talking to you from New York. Uh, I think you Florida has to claim Donald Trump as you know as a Floridian <laughs> now, and we'll talk about the Florida man concept in a bit. But, you know, what do you make of the anti-immigrant sentiment, which seems to be rising throughout the country, but also in places like Florida where people are streaming in? Um, where does it come from I don't, and how do you yeah, how do you manage well, it? Well, first, I think there's a legitimate concern about an open border mm -hmm. and whether you are pro-immigration like I am or a nativist and want to close legal immigration even. Um, Great countries, all countries should have the right to control their border. And this this current administration, the previous administration had great rhetoric, didn't do much, did, did a little bit better. But this administration has been um, 
you know, the, the convergence of bad policy and bad politics, uh, you want to stay away from that intersection. Mm-hmm. And he manages to sit right in the yeah. center of it with his border policy. So there's a lot of anger and frustration for that. Um, I'm not sure that's that's um, a xenophobic feeling at all. Mm-hmm. I think it's a legitimate concern about um, the this wave of people taking advantage of a broken immigration system. You know, these people come and they claim a, they say they have a well-founded fear of persecution and ultimately 5% will have a legitimate mm-hmm. claim and they should be allowed in. 95% don't after four years because the court, courts are all clogged up and then they get their deportation order and the likelihood of them showing up for that is uh, slim or not. How so, would you, how would um, you address that then? Because, there, you know, and there is that separate issue of legal immigration, which people like Donald Trump has said, he, you know, when he was president, he wanted to reduce legal immigration. He did. Independent. He actually did. Yeah. Um, you know, but how, how do you deal with the border? And then how do you kind of disconnect the two so that people aren't thinking so, immigration is by definition a criminal act almost? You, you change the asylum laws to require people to make their claims outside the country. Uh, the Trump administration for a while did that, but they, they may not have had the legal basis to do it by executive order. You need to change the law. Um, that would be one element. Controlling the border using technology and, uh, and, and a wall where appropriate. It's not appropriate across every mile, but it certainly uh, um, would, would, would provide uh, some security there. Use E-Verify properly. Um, create a guest worker program where it's easy to come to work legally than it is to come illegally. Right. Um, create a uh, narrow the people that are coming by family reunification. We're the only country in the world that has spouse and minor children like all other countries, but also adult siblings and adult parents. So we've had, you know, since 1965, mm-hmm. Um, majority of people coming are coming through that family reunification. A lot of them are not as productive mm-hmm. as, as they could be if you narrowed that and expanded the number of people coming that aren't taking jobs away, but are creating jobs. Use the Canada model. Mm-hmm. Um, deal with the, you know, the dreamers that uh, through no fault of their own are here mm-hmm. and give them a path. And when to you say deal with them, those, yeah, you mean offer them a way to be here legally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. Yeah. These are like 25 year old young men and women now. They have no nexus to the country that their parents brought them in. I mean, let's be realistic about it. And then for the 10 to 12 million people that are probably 12, 13 now, million people here um, uh, illegally, give them a path to, to, to uh, residency, not, not citizenship, which I think would be the fair thing to do. Now, that's a, I wrote a book about this, mm-hmm. and those were the ideas. Yep. And those ideas, I wrote that in 2013. And it still applies because the political class up in D.C. want to use this. Both sides want to use this as a political wedge issue. Yeah. What you know, you uh, and your brother were in in many ways, the you know, you're kind of like the, a dying breed of pro-immigration and pro-immigrant Republicans. Um, what has happened to the Republican Party that it has veered so far away from seemingly having anything good to say about immigrants? I don't know. I mean, uh, I think there are a lot of Republicans that are pro-immigrant, per se. Um, but our, look, the reason why people are angry is the systems that we've relied on, the institutions we've relied on, haven't worked. We can't enforce our existing laws as it relates to immigration. People get upset. I think it's legitimate. Um, you have the avalanche of fentanyl coming into our country and the tragedy that that brings. You have, um, I mean, like all, I mean, think of an is what, what institution is, is working the way it should in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. And so there is a deep resentment that the elites are doing quite well. You know, like I'm, I'm blessed. I got a healthy family, an intact family. Uh, I'm in I'm in business in a way that I can add value. You know, I got a great life, and a lot of other people do. But there are a ton of people that are one paycheck away from real hardship, and the system hasn't been working for a lot of those folks. And so you try to find scapegoats, and whether you like President Trump or, or not, I'm not a big fan. Mm-hmm. Um, he has tapped into that anger better than any politician in the last generation of time. And it explains, I think, in that connection, 
um, explains his um, pretty strong hold on the Republican Party right now. Does that hold worry you going into 2024? And, you know, to keep it kind of in Florida, you know, you have Trump hold up in Mar-a-Lago. Uh, you have DeSantis, who in many ways has, you know, he courted Trump. Uh, he's very Trump-like in many of his policies, even if he's not doing very well. Is there a future for a Republican Party that is really centered around a kind of Trump personality and agenda, which seems to be, you know, we got to close the borders, we got to, you know, exert more control over everyday life, things like that? I think... Uh, the way you deal with the legitimate resentment that people feel and the anger and the angst that they feel is to fix the things that are broken. And if that happens, I think people, a person, a candidate or a, uh, a message that is more hopeful and optimistic about the future rather than one that's about grievance and anger um, could prevail. But right now uh, that's not the case. And so it's, you know, it's hard to see how in 2024 there'll be any kind of sea change on that. But Nick, I mean, think about it. If you compare the United States to other countries, we're, we're the only developed country that could rebuild our demographic pyramid, mm-hmm. that could be young and dynamic again. We lead the world in all sorts of innovations and technologies. We have a pretty good neighborhood. If we control the border, mm-hmm. Mexico is not going to invade us. The Canadians, you know. You got to keep they, your they eye on them, gonna... but generally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, we got a huge border with them. Maybe they'll, mm-hmm. uh, but they're one tenth our size. And they've got the Atlantic and Pacific. I mean, Europe is confronted with all sorts of, of historical and current challenges that make us look really peaceful. Mm-hmm. China's demography is a disaster. Their economy is a disaster. The debt loads they have are very similar to ours. But we can renew ourselves. Yeah. Um, but it requires fixing some really important things. and. I would hope that the conservative side of politics would be the ones that offer those up because the other guys are going to offer, you know, more whatever green new deals and Mm -hmm. infrastructure business where you mandate if you're, you know, you have to have a left-handed Albanian in your uh, cabinet Mm -hmm. or or your board of directors or just all this weird stuff that the progressives Mm -hmm. love to impose on people. It's going to, it's, it's not going to look good. Um, If we get back in the game, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited for my grandchildren. Right now, I worry about it. What um, do you think uh, the Republican Party, you know, a decade ago or 20 years ago, um, it did seem to be leaning, Look, when it looked to the future, it seemed to be leaning libertarian of saying, you know, government should be doing a few essential things yeah. and doing them well. That got derailed, you know, by wars. It got derailed by administrative bloat and a lot of other things. But now when you look at the Republican Party, you, you, it's rare to see anybody have nobody has a libertarian bone in their body. They're not talking about spending. They're not talking about reducing the size and scope of government is a, you know, does the Republican party need to go libertarian in order to kind of win the future? I, I, look, I, I'm out of politics. Uh, I guess I'm so old school that I think believing in freedom and limited government and entrepreneurial capitalism, uh, rather than picking winners and losers and doing it through government is the path forward. I've always believed that I haven't changed my mind. Um, I don't know, but maybe the indication indicator is, is the subscription base of reason. Is it up or down? Yeah. Well, we're because, reaching more people, <laughs> but, you know, so that's maybe good. that's good, but we'll keep it know. up because you got <laughs> keep working it. Cause it doesn't look like it's having much effect in DC right now. You're absolutely right. Conservatives, you know, when Jim Jordan trying to buy votes, literally to buy votes to, to get become a, the speaker says, well, I'll, gu- I'll guarantee you we'll get rid of the salt, um, you know, bring back the salt deduction right. for high income people in high, you know, high well, in big state government and local states. Income to, or the state and local tax deduction, which was the yeah, one so great was a cap thing. on it. With the, yeah, that was great. That it the was the feds did that. <laughs> it was the only Exactly. And, you know, it was uh, why should people in Florida pay for the the burdensome nature of the government mm-hmm. in New Jersey or New York? And so he was willing to buy that by a handful of votes, I guess, uh, by apparently in the, I've, I've read that uh, mm-hmm. in the midst of his negotiations. Well, a conservative would never do that. Mm-hmm. Like, so these are this is a different version. These are populists, maybe mm-hmm. not conservatives. They're certainly not libertarian. Um 
I mean, the only thing that I would say in the defense of the Republican Party, it's not as bad as the Democratic yeah. Party. What is but so it's certainly bad? not like what is so no bad? one wakes up in a cold sweat saying the deficit's too high. Yeah. What is so bad about the Democratic Party under Joe Biden at this point? Um, proposing what a six trillion dollar uh, spending plan for money and with money we didn't don't have and only getting two trillion or something. You know, these are big numbers. Um, his using the regulatory state to um, to carry out his agenda. Uh, I have a business that we're involved in that that helps uh, that refurbishes transformers. Well, there's now a new law, a new rule that's uh, going through the process that would basically eliminate the supply chain of transformers, mm -hmm. which is kind of important if you want to electrify the the uh, transportation system mm -hmm. and harden the grid and expand. I mean, think of all the GPUs that are necessary for mm -hmm. uh, data processing. And, you know, this all requires transformers and another, it's a policy that deals with uh, um, using materials that we can't, we, we don't make mm -hmm. uh, to be part of the transformer uh, manufacturing process that will have less carbon emissions. So it's it's this multitude of agendas yeah. that are imposed that make it harder and harder for the United States to compete. Yeah, did, that troubles me. Did you ever think I mean as you were, you know, rising through the ranks and whatnot that, you know, after the 2000 that you would be seeing the rise of anti-free trade people on the Democratic side and the Republican side uh, and people being anti-immigrant. Uh, you know, again, in 2000, I didn't see it. No, yeah. I didn't see it. I didn't see it when I was governor either. Um, no, this is this is this has happened. Um, maybe in increments not discernible to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. It's kind of happened over time, like all things do. I mean, that that's we're living. We're not in a linear world. We mm -hmm. we're in a cyclical world, and the cycle right now uh, is people are very comfortable with uh, advocating government solutions to everything. Yeah. Now, another reason why I love Florida is get, the contagion hasn't spread mm -hmm. to other places. I mean, we're AAA bond rated and we don't have an income tax. We, uh, under Governor Scott, uh, I think they reduced the debt, the state debt by 70%. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no debt issued in the eight years that Rick Scott was governor. Um, what other state did that in a high growth situation? I certainly didn't. Charlie Chris didn't do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Governor DeSantis has, but um, there is a way to show that you can, you know, pursue limited government mm -hmm. ideas and balance the budget, create reserves, deal with eight, you know, hurricanes all the time, um, have a don't have a bloated government, um, and and help people and put the people that are most vulnerable in the front of the line. That 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 philosophy still exists here. Um, you, uh, one of the ways, or one of the things that's kind of unique about Florida is the special tax districts, which have become, you know, kind of a big thing, uh, you know, uh, between fights between Disney and DeSantis and whatnot. Could you explain quickly what those are and are you in favor of maintaining them? Cause how, how many are there in Florida? I mean, there are Oof, hundreds. There, there's a ton of them. Yeah. Some of them are very limited in their scope, water districts mm -hmm. and others. Um, they're, they're regional in some cases. Uh, they, some of them have taxing powers uh, and you know, the proper thing to do is hold them to account, mm -hmm. um, sunset them, review them. The case of the Reedy Creek, it is pretty unique. In fact, it's the only one of its kind, which is the, in effect the quasi county government. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it was pretty smart to do in whatever nineteen sixty, because there were two counties where the, Disney's property existed, and this was a way to assure that the quality that Disney had mm -hmm. in terms of governance infrastructure could be maintained. And frankly, the infrastructure in inside Reedy Creek is world class. No. Yeah. I mean, it's not I'm not kidding, like best infrastructure in the United mm -hmm. States. So there was a reason for doing it. I remember when I was governor, we had sixty eight chalices, silver chalices that were part of the SS Florida uh you know group of silverware for for hosting people, I guess. And the sixty eighth was Reedy Creek. Mm -hmm. Um it was kind of part of who we were. Uh I, I, I don't know. I'm 
I'm uncomfortable with changing that. I think it's important to, to have accountability around it. And the governor's task, or the board that he's replaced the Disney executives, I guess, mm. are, are supposed to be doing that as long as it's not punitive. I mean, but it was look, right. I mean, whether, he explicitly said well, he was going after Disney because they crossed him on a couple of laws or initiatives. It, it, yes. Uh, it's it's it was punitive in terms of rhetoric for sure is it punitive in terms of the operations of disney and mm-hmm. central florida mm, i don't know yeah. no i'm not sure uh but i hope it isn't because uh 80,000 employees and billions of dollars of investment it's the, it's a principal reason why we don't have an income tax in mm-hmm. our state uh, i mean 32 million people last time i checked go to go to the disney properties mm-hmm. It's an economic driver of success for a ton of other people, not just the employees of Disney. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think you need to be respectful of that. And if the youngins out in Southern California are woke, okay, fine. I mean, the, the Disney CEO should have should have like slapped him across the face and said, you know, grow up. Mm. The fact that he didn't um, created this kind of vulnerability for Disney and and I think the this passage of the law was more than appropriate, but um, if you go beyond you know the rhetorical slapping Disney in the face mm-hmm. uh, where you're actually hurting the enterprise, you're you're hurting Florida. Yeah. and I don't know. I don't think I think the the rule on that the there is it's not clear mm-hmm. whether that's happened or not. Would you uh, talk a little bit about Excel in Ed, which you're the head of? Um, why you know this is a a, a group that really pushes, um, you know, kind of personalized backpack funding, a variety of school reforms that really give parents and students more control over how they get educated or how they educate themselves. Um, What motivated you to focus on education and education choice? I think, uh, I mean, I've been interested in education, parental choice and education since, gosh, we founded uh, Floridians for Educational Choice in 1990. Mm-hmm. Tom Feeney, uh, who was a, became the Speaker of the House in Florida, and myself, and Billy Neese was a person in Fort Myers. We created this, and the first event we did was a barbecue with Polly Williams, hmm. who was the uh, sponsor of the legislation in Wisconsin. Right. I go that far back. Yeah, yeah. And a, I just a think- local uh, councilwoman who had been a member of the Black Panther Party and whatnot, a real you know, Earl mover and shaker in school choice. She, she, she sponsored the bill and Tommy Thompson mm-hmm. supported it and passed it into law. And, uh, I kind of yearn for those days where on, at least on the one thing that a conservative and a liberal would agree on, they would pause and actually act on it. Yeah. And that's what they did. Um, so I, I just think, you know, in a world where you want more parental engagement and you want them to be informed consumers of the most important service mm-hmm. that, their family will ever have, which is a quality education, they're going to be a better arbiter of what's right for their kids and a better judge of what the best school is. And Florida was, you know, basically parents were locked out. Mm -hmm. And so apart from advocating, I got a a chance to act on that. And successive governors and legislatures have followed up after that. Mm -hmm. So one of the lessons in policy world is success is never final, reforms never complete. Mm -hmm. Governor DeSantis gets great credit with the legislature passing a full-blown, I'm not kidding, education savings account Mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of students today, but literally at, you know, 10 years from now, it could be over a million students will be going to the school that their parents choose. Miami-Dade right now, gosh, 60% of of, of students are going to a school, public or private, that their parents choose. Mm -hmm. And Miami-Dade's school system is considered the best urban school district Mm -hmm. in the country. There's not, it's not a surprise for me that if you empower parents, you're going to get a diversity of offerings. And if you have accountability around that and parents understand where their kids stand, you're going to get a great result. And, you know, for the elite families, everything's gonna be fine, you know, because they're, they're the first teachers of their kids. They tutor their kids. They pay for you know, they pay for tutors. They do all this stuff to protect their kids and help them learn. But what about the 90 percent of families that don't have that luxury? You better make sure your schools are vibrant, are focused on the future. Make sure kids can read by third grade, access to algebra uh, in, in the middle schools, 
have career orientation where appropriate in high school and um and have just high expectations because kids are smarter than we give them credit for and you know so excel and ed takes these ideas takes them on the road we were the florida literacy efforts were emulated in mississippi and mississippi's had the greatest gains in early education based on the napes you know the nation's report card it was 50th out of 50 and it went um it's it's now it's the only state in the pandemic era that has actually seen significant Mm -hmm. gains why because they they had high expectations for kids mostly minority kids mostly low-income kids they trained teachers on the science of reading, not the bogus other approach the majority of teachers were taught. And uh, they ended social promotion in third grade. And it, it can work. Yeah. I mean, and now the so-called Mississippi miracle, it's really not a miracle. It's hard work by teachers that are trained appropriately where resources are given to let them let them soar. Do you think there's a contradiction uh, among conservative education reformers where on the one hand, there's an emphasis on choice, which you know, at various points, people, you know, liberals or people on the left talked about it, but that's kind of faded. They're very locked into a kind of centralized status quo, you know, old model. Um, But conservatives who say on the one hand, they want to give parents more and more choice, but then people like Ron DeSantis who say, okay, but certain books, certain curricula, certain things are off the table. Um, Is that a contradiction? Um, that needs to be kind of explored and and blown up. Yeah, but show me the books that were banned, Mm -hmm. so-called book, you know, banned. The the books in question were removed from elementary school to age appropriate places. Mm -hmm. Is that appropriate? Yeah, I think it is. Um, Look, there's there's so much misinformation these days. and people, you know, they aggregate their news in ways that uh, validates their beliefs. Mm-hmm. They're not learning anything. They're just getting their views validated. I think I heard you talk about that on uh, <laughs> Megan Kelly or someplace. Probably. It's, yeah. You know. Something we, that we confirms need to be, your beliefs, right? A, a program or a show that confirms what you already know. Yeah. yeah. There is there is definitely confirmation bias mm-hmm. in all the information we get. And uh I mean, I know the people, Manny Diaz is the commissioner of education. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've talked to him about this and the amount of heat uh, that has been generated. I mean, look, Governor DeSantis, he's been a really effective governor mm-hmm. and I think he's done a fine job, but he's controversial as all get out by design. Yeah. You know, what do you candidate Ron candidate? Ron wants to get wants to wants the libs all fired up because yeah. that is kind of the way we play politics. Now, Governor Ron if you look at actually with the, you know, what's what's happened and the implementation of it, um, it's a little bit different. And, you know, I, I like I like leadership at the governor's place because things can you can move the needle there. Yeah. You know, and that's what that's what he's done. And Florida is a better place because he's been an aggressive governor. What do you think about uh, his, you know, shipping or, or sending migrants to, you know, places like New York City or Martha's Vineyard and stuff like that? Well, that's a virtue signaling, very creative one. Yeah. Um, it seems to have gotten the attention mm-hmm. of people. And now you have big city mayors that are saying the Biden administration has got to get its act together and forcing the border. Had that not had had G- Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis and maybe other governors not done this, they probably wouldn't have gotten that attention. Do I do I am I comfortable with, you know, people looking who 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 know, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I'm not concerned that about people crossing the border like they're bad people at all. Mm-hmm. If I was in their circumstance, I would do the exact mm-hmm. same thing. That doesn't make it right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have broken immigration law that's not enforced, and uh, these are, you know, these these families. Um, I have sympathy for them for sure, mm-hmm. but the Biden administration should get its act together and they ought to work with Congress to fix the laws that are broken and they ought to enforce the existing laws in a much better way. Hmm. And they're negligent on this. And a lot of people are suffering. You think about the people that don't make it to the border because they believe uh, that they can get in. Think of the loss of life. Think of the uh, amount of money that the coyotes have gotten. Mm -hmm. The drug dealers have gotten, you know, this is a disaster. It's a humanitarian disaster. And the focus ought to be on, 
the Biden administration, their inability to follow, to follow the law. Uh, as a uh, final question, um, the concept of the Florida man, you know, a, a, you know, a person, it's usually a man, it can be a woman, uh, you know, doing incredibly insane, stupid things often while, you know, after snorting whatever was around uh, and things like that has become ubiquitous over the past decade. What do you make of the Florida man meme? Uh, it, look, it's uh, it's probably not fair, mm -hmm. but who cares? It's funny. Yeah. Um, we should embrace it. You know, like we're we're striving to have a disproportionate number of candidates for the Darwin Award each year, <laughs> and we should be very proud of it. Yeah, you want to run the table? We'll take. I'll tell you what. I'll take the Florida man. All the people laughing at Florida because of that. Yeah. Uh, I'll take our tax structure. I'll take our environmental policy. I'll take our education mm -hmm. system. I'll take our way of life, uh, and um, I'll be okay. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. You know, it, it's interesting. So, Florida is now the third most populous state. Um, you know, the top four are uh, California, Texas, Florida, and New York. New York, California, and Texas all have strong kind of identities that people know. You know, California was the dream. New York is New York City and the hurly burly and all of that. Texas, uh, where I, sadly, I passed two years in Huntsville, Texas, so uh, that I don't talk about too much, but... Um, it, you were in Huntsville? By, by, I was living outside the prison, so yeah. Okay. I, I, uh, <laughs> I was uh, like, wow. But um, Texas is its own, you know, its own country, its own region. It has its, you know, does Florida have an identity or a culture that can, you know, galvanize the nation, or can it become the next big thing in kind of American identity? I, th I think it can, but it's a great question, Nick, because uh, my brother, when he got elected, I went to his inauguration and same size crowd as my inauguration in 1998. Uh, not everything is bigger in Texas, <laughs> but there were no American flags. They were all Texas flags, right. hundreds of them all around. You know, fast forward to my inauguration, there were like, there wasn't even a Florida flag on top of the state capitol. <laughs> there were American flags, though, all yeah. over the place. Uh, but the, it, we don't have a. I think we have an emerging identity, but it's not. It's not clear. It's more mm -hmm. Florida is a group of regions mm -hmm. in many ways, um, and South Florida is very different than the Panhandle. Mm -hmm. It would be helpful to have a sense of shared identity uh, for the state. I've, I've always advocated that. I don't think we've reached our full potential there. And by the way. I'd kind of like that for our own country. Mm -hmm. What is the shared identity that we have in our country now? We're, we're tribal and we're broken ourselves up in all these disparate parts. I mean, Florida does mirror the United States in that yeah. way in some fashions, but it's a more positive. Um, Very much so, yeah. Positive place. What, I mean, can, people are can, proud to live in Jacksonville, proud to live in Tampa, yeah. but they're not necessarily, that doesn't always translate to proud to live in Florida. Um, you know, going back to the, the concept of a shared identity for America in our history, you know, we've had various ones, including, you know, we were the, the Puritans and the Pilgrims. Uh, we were the westward explorers. We were uh, a nation of immigrants was certainly a huge one the, you know, that I, you know, think about a lot. My, all of my grandparents were immigrants from Europe, but that ended sometime around the end of the cold war, it seems. Do you have, like, what is, you know, do you have an idea of what a cultural identity for America that is inclusive enough so that, you know, everybody who's here feels part of it, but also not so loose that it becomes meaningless? Yeah, I mean, I think th this will sound like a cliche, and that's sad that it does, but I would say the shared identity should be that it doesn't matter where you start in life, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you were born. Uh, it doesn't, it, it, what, what matters is that you have a chance to rise up mm -hmm. and that your hard work will be rewarded and that you, you know, you'll be part of the exceptionalism of our country where mm -hmm. people, irrespective of where they start in life, have a chance to, to succeed. And uh, that's being challenged like never before. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people don't believe that that's the case anymore. And so they resort to more government or they resort to, you know, collective action mm -hmm. rather than. Uh, pursuing their dreams as they see fit. I think America at its best is, you know, crazy, chaotic, 
uh, two steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm. It's not planned out. Um, the great, um, you know, the great businesses, the great ideas that will emerge in the post pandemic era. I'm really excited about, mm -hmm. um, history's replete of examples of this. And at a time when we really need that sense of shared identity, I think it's eroded to the point where it, it, it may be of all the things that trouble me, that's that and the fiscal deficit are the two things that trouble me the most. All right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for talking to Reason, Governor Jeb Bush. Thanks, Nick.